20 years, so be something. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. This is the regular meeting of the Zionsville Board of Parks and Recreation for Wednesday, April 13th. And before we take the roll call, I'd like to recognize we have a new board member with us tonight, Chris Barksdale. Chris was approved unanimously by the school board to replace Aaron Bidwell, who resigned last month. So uh, Chris, why don't you just take a minute here and introduce yourself? Okay, I, um, I've lived in Zionsville for 15 years. I am a teacher in the schools. I teach English as a second language. Um, and let's see, I was asked to talk about the parks a little bit. I am an avid trail walker in Zionsville and I'm interested in being on the board just because I think there's a lot of really good stuff happening. I'm interested in both the parks and the rec side of what Zionsville is doing along with the conservation efforts. Um, so that's kind of what drew me and I, I wanna thank the school board for appointing me and the opportunity to play a role in uh, shaping what our rec program might look like in Zionsville for the future. Great. So, Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. All right. That being said, let's take roll call. Jill Pack. Here. Uh, John Wollenberg. Here. Tim Cassidy. Here. John Salowitz. Here. Sarah Moore. Here. Chris Barksdale. Here. All righty. We're going to go ahead and get started here. The first item on the agenda uh, is the approval and discussion of the March 9th minutes. Um, does anybody have any comments on the minutes? Any corrections? Do I have a motion to approve? I move they be approved as submitted. And Cassidy moves that they be approved as submitted. Anybody have a second? I second. Sec Go ahead. I second. John Salo with seconds. Let's take a quick vote. <laughs> Sarah Moore. Or I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Jill Pack. Aye. John Wollenberg. Aye. Tim Cassidy. Aye. John Salowitz. Aye. Sarah Moore. Aye. Chris Barksdale. Abstain. All right. Thank you. So we have uh, six in favor and one abstention. All right, we're going to continue on with the agenda now. The next item is the um, Overly Warman Park, the Friends of Overly Warman Park. Uh, as you all know, work continues there with an expected opening now in May. And really happy to tell you tonight that we have some neighbors uh, from the adjacent Bonterra neighborhood that have formed a group to support the park and help its ongoing operations. Um, and we are going to hear from them now. We have Jacob Bradley and Ryan Cambridge from the Friends of Overly Warman Park to tell us what they have in mind. Gentlemen. Thanks, John. Do you need our addresses for the record? Sure. 5834 Muscadine Way. I'm also the president of the Vontaire Homeowners Association. Yeah. Ryan? Uh, 10330 Arilla Circle uh, in Vontaire also, and I'm on the HOA board, but luckily not the president. Great. He was the only person that voted against his appointment. So. <laughs> well, you're here now, and that's, that's important. Right. So. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, we're thank you for taking a couple minutes to um, to chat with us tonight. Really, we hope tonight is more of just an introduction of what um, we think can be a really great long term relationship. Um, little, we can give a little bit of background on each of us. But as we start, you know, both of us are have been in the neighborhood. We we're both Phase One folks in Bonterra, so we've had the pleasure of watching No Really Warm and develop over the last handful of years. And don't tell anybody, but the pleasure of playing back there before it was developed, also. So we're very excited to see the progress, um, and very excited about the opportunities that that park will provide, not just our neighborhood, but the town as a whole. Um, so again, my name is Ryan Cambridge. My background, uh, I'm a landscape architect. My area of specialty, if you can call it that, over the last 15 years or so has been in park planning and park design. So um, I've worked for companies from Florida all the way up to back to Indianapolis, which is where we're from originally. Um, and, you know, it's really been a passion of mine. Uh, and of that, one of the things that um, I've been an advocate for with a lot of my clients, uh, which are other municipal organizations or municipal governments, is the need to have these really well-functioning and active friends groups and a park foundation within every park system. So um, as we formed uh, the Friends of Overly Mormon Park, which it's hard to believe that it's been two years, I mean, um, pretty much uh, before they even broke ground back there, we wanted to get that in place so that we knew from day one that we'd be available to help uh, and around and are very excited now and encouraged to know that there is also a town-wide park foundation. So we look forward to finding opportunities to partner with them uh, in the future. Um, and when I, when I look at that, you know, I think that, um, you know, 
the purpose of over the Friends of Overly Warm Park in my mind is really just to find any way that we can help Jared and his team um, with that park uh, centered around, you know, raising awareness, uh, organizing volunteer efforts, raising funds for specific capital projects that uh, Jared and his team might deem needed over time. Um, as we all know, parks are sort of living and breathing things that evolve and change with time, and we want to be there to help facilitate that. Uh, also helps that my lot literally backs up on the park. So I think we chatted when construction started. I was like, I could be full time, 24 hour a day construction administration <laughs> <laughs> from my bedroom. So, um, but anyway, we're we're just really here to um, to donate our time and effort and and speak on behalf of the whole Ontario neighborhood in the sense that um, you know we're all very excited about the park. Uh, and very appreciative of the efforts that the town has been putting in. Um, and then maybe one step beyond that, we don't see this and don't want this to be an organization that is limited to any one specific neighborhood. This, we envision this as being a traditional friends group, anybody that's a fan of the park or wants to support or donate time or resources to make the park as great as it can is, as far as we're concerned, welcome. Um, and we look forward to working with the town and Jared to help in any way we can. And we have had a few people reach out already expressing interest so we're going to build that group um i think our plan for this year is just to get our name out there mm -hmm. let people know who we are really build up our membership and probably organize some sort of a work day in the summer early fall something like that make sure the park's nice and clean um and i'm an attorney in town here i work at a, a practice of the firm called quarrels and brady uh, mainly business to business disputes that involve the courts but uh in my free time i like to i'd say jog on the trails i don't think you can call what i do running but um i really enjoy it he's being modest he runs like 50 miles at a time so <laughs> that's, that's not an exaggeration well, that's great to hear we have high hopes for overly warm and park but it's going to be well used by people in town here not just by people in your neighborhood and i just want to say that i think it's great that you have organized this group on your own and that you're stepping up and taking this role and uh we would be more than happy to work with you as we go forward here and, and make that park as good as it can be for everybody in Zionsville and also for your neighborhood. You know, we want to be good neighbors too. So, so thank you so much. And I would open it up to anybody else. If anybody has any questions or comments that they'd like to direct toward these gentlemen. My only comment is the key will be using the park first and foremost. So from that, you and we will learn a lot. I'm oh sure. yeah. Yep. Yeah, as I would tell my parks clients from the design side, uh, the ribbon cutting is really just day one, right? You know, these parks evolve and change with trends over time and with people as they come and go. So I think having a functional friends group um, that is also a 501c3 nonprofit, which we have that designation. Um, so we're able to raise money and keep funds specifically for projects uh, like this. That helps provide sort of a threat of continuity uh, amongst time as things kind of change and we'll be there to help. As a landscape architect, you uh, feel good about the plans there and how I it's do, all coming together? I do, actually. So when we bought the house, when we closed on our, well, when we picked our lot, it was back in 2017. And <laughs> my background in, in landscape architecture is more on the planning side than it is on like the plant selection, the detail side. And so, of course, I was researching land uses and adjacent owners and seeing what plans were going on for what. And that's when I came across the plan uh, for Overly Warm. And I'm very familiar with Rendell Onsberger and Tricia and uh, all the folks there. Um, they're a very well respected firm. I know them personally. And that helped me a lot because I'm like, all right, it'll, you know, yeah. I know it'll happen. It'll be good. And we're, we're very excited about it. Great. Well, I just want to say thank you as somebody who, um, in my regular job has to try to rally people around our projects. It's really amazing to have you guys come to us and be excited and, you know, already trying to help this project. So that's wonderful and thank you. How do you plan on getting the word out to the community other than just your park, your neighborhood, excuse me? It's a good question. I think we're, um, need to get it. We're at a point now where we, we kind of rushed early on to get everything pulled together, to get the 501c3 designation, get a website launch, all that. And then we kind of press pause as Jared and his team were through trudging through the construction process. And we're at a regrouping phase now where um, as we think about the park, be, people being more aware of the park that are obviously outside of our neighborhood um, that you know we felt like to do it properly, we probably needed the park open so that there was that, that awareness of the park itself and that we wanna find ways over the coming months to activate the park, whether that's through as Jared or Jake said, a, a cleanup day um, you know, or I don't know, I think TBD, but through probably different events at the park. And we also envision being present at other community events where we'll get our word out about the organization and opportunities that folks have to either contribute financially or just in time. 
And Jared's helping us as well. We're going to have a photo shoot at the park opening and actually specifically reference the friends group. Um, we do have a website posted and Jared's made a few other introductions for us to some of the foundation folks. So we'll keep working networks and, and yep. making sure people find out about Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yeah, your website looks great. And what, what is the address for that? Boy. <laughs> <laughs> friends of OWP. It's friends of OWP, yeah. Friends of OWP.com. Yep. Okay, great. Well, I hope a lot of people will go to it. A lot of people that see this meeting tonight will, will go to it and check it out. I think it's it's well put together. And uh, obviously, you guys have thought this out and have a good approach. Do you have other social media presence? Um, we, Facebook? We don't, right? As OWP. Um, again, we've kind of been in a holding pattern waiting for the park to open. But I see all of those things as being critical ultimately to getting the word out. I'm not a proponent of any single method, but sort of carpet bombing <laughs> all that you can, right? Uh, any channels that are available. So um, I would stay tuned for that. Right for right now, since the website is up and active, it does need a little bit of updating, but it is functional and live. Um, that's probably the easiest source of information. If you want to direct folks there, if they ask for, you know, opportunities to volunteer, or contacts for things like that, obviously, Jared is first and foremost, but that's a place that they could get information about our group specifically. OWP friends. There's a Facebook page. We do have a Facebook page. Facebook page. Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recalling we create because we don't really post things, as you probably said, yeah. but we created that before we got the web website launched. Okay. So we envision probably having a continuity of all the social media platforms at some point in the near future. When I searched for your name, that's the first one that came up. So yeah. And it's OWPfriends.org. OWFreeFriends.org. Oh. Yeah, Man, I feel like we probably should have looked up. Like looked up. <laughs> All good. I just want to make sure it's out there. That was so long ago that we did that. <laughs> it's funny. Oh, well. Appreciate the advanced planning. And, and uh, Jacob, you have my number. I do. Share it with uh, Ryan if you want to. And uh, Jared, you have his number. And I, you know, I promise that we'll be a, an open door for any ideas or anything that you want to bring to us that can improve the park or help the neighborhood down there. Well, and let's keep that a two-way street, too. If you all discover things that, man, we could really use help with this, or we're having a challenge with this, or we need to raise some funds for that, you know, let us know, and we'll we'll rally the troops to the degree that we're able. Great. All right. Anybody else? All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. You. Sure appreciate do appreciate it. it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you down there for the ribbon cutting of the park. <laughs> all right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the Pathways Committee update. And... Um, in the past years here, we've had a regular report from the Pathways Committee, but we have kind of gotten away from that a bit. And uh, last year, Sarah Moore volunteered to be our liaison to the Pathways Committee. She's walking out the door right now, but we're going to get her to come back. Um, and she's going to give us regular updates on what the Pathways Committee is doing and how we can work with them better on matters of common interest. Uh, so we'll get her back here in just a second and get her to take the podium and give us that update. Her timing and walking out the door was not great, but she'll be right back. I'll mention one more thing about the uh, Friends of Overly Warman group. Um, so the community, when they planned out the park, picked two activities that have a very vigilant, caring group of stakeholders, and that's uh, Frisbee golf and mountain biking. So. I can very easily see the friends group serving as the notification center in addition to the town for letting those uh, members that use those uh, facilities know whether the trails are closed because of weather, whether there's a hole that's out or other uh, cautions like that as the park gets weathered. So yeah, it seems like the neighborhood's activated. When when we had the idea of maybe putting another dog park there, they were certainly activated and absolutely, uh, and, you know, came at us uh, with their opinions on that rather quickly. So it's good to see that people are engaged. Yep. Engagement's always good. All right, Sarah, Pathways Committee report. All right, sorry about that. Um, well, basically, the Pathways Committee we met in. Oh, in March. And during that meeting, a couple of the things that we talked about, one are that we wanted to revise the uh, trail study that had been done last, I believe, in 2016. Um, so we're looking at ways to do that. The trouble is that the Pathways Committee doesn't actually have a budget. So um, we're trying to find ways to get that done. We think that would be valuable as we're doing all this other planning around parks and the community. So that was one of the bigger things that we've been working on. We are also trying to find a way to help out um, with different events. I know that we've been contacted about helping with the Green Fest. And so we are going to, I know we are going to have people volunteer for that and help out with 
I think um, we've been asked about the bicycle parking and trying to find ways to get people to bike to uh, Greenfest and then possibly overly warm in when that opens up. So we're just looking for ways that we can help and be a part of what's going on with trails in the community. And then this month we did not have a meeting, but we will meet again next month. Okay. Uh, my plan is to have Sarah report to us about the Pathways Committee every other month. And on the opposing months, uh, we're going to get a report from Jill on the Parks Foundation. She's our liaison to the Parks Foundation. So next week or next month, excuse me, we'll uh, hear from Jill on the Parks Foundation. This call. All right. Next item on the agenda is public presentations or comments. Do we have anybody that would like to offer some comments to us now? It appears that we don't. Anybody online, John? No? Okay. All right, then we'll move right into staff reports and we begin with our superintendent, Jared Logston. Thank you, John. Uh, just a couple of things to highlight from the report. I wanna uh, extend a, an extra thank you um, and hand to the Department of Public Works for their quick work out at Heritage Trail Park. Within the last month, they formed up and poured a brand new uh, concrete pad right next to the uh, community gardens. So this pad will not only serve as an accessible route to get to raised garden beds, which will be, will be provided as an Eagle Scout project later this year, but also that pad will host our future hoop house where we'll have gardening programming out of. So just another kudos to our Department of Public Works for their assistance on that. Um, I wanted to give an update on the golf course as well. So as you know, it uh, most certainly rains in spring in Indiana. So uh, we made a lot of progress last fall and were able to collaborate with Duke Energy and work together side by side. We have some irrigation repairs that we're hoping to also get done before we open up uh, the season this year. But ultimately, um, we got caught by the weather in the winter and the project uh, needs about 10 more working days to finish up. So being in a floodplain, the golf course is extremely soggy, much longer than our yards and other areas around town. So we're, we're truly watching the weather every week and exploring every opportunity we can to get the crews back out there to finish up that work. So we've discussed um, adding two foot wide stone shoulders to some of the worst areas that are the soggiest. That'll not only extend the life of our paths and fortify those um, for the future, but also allow the axles to drive over the pathways without destroying the work they're trying to lay down. So we're waiting on some numbers from that and we might present that here in the next couple of days. Um, beyond that, the forecast looks outstanding for the next eight days. So we're really hoping over the weekend, the course will dry out and we can see the crews back out there next week. Um, and we have, our, our contractor is paying attention, right? There's reason to believe that they are checking on a regular basis and they're ready to get in as soon as they can. Absolutely. Um, Charlie, he's uh, the lead uh, person out on site and he has been visiting the site weekly. Uh, we actually met with him last week to discuss our options outside of just waiting on mother nature to allow us to get out there, so. Uh, we are being vigilant, and the, the moment is it appropriate to go back out, uh, they will be there. And I think it should be said, too, that while obviously there's a lot of interest in getting the golf course open again, it doesn't make any sense to open it before it's ready uh, because you could do more damage to the course and then you know, better to get it right before it opens to the public. Is, is that right? Is there, is there, would a viable plan B be to open it uh, and... Uh, temporarily secure paths? We have explored that, but you know, um, I think opening for a short term, as we know, it is going to begin to dry out later in April and then into May. I think it's more advantageous just to continue to work on some of the other projects we are, like the clubhouse being painted and the irrigation, as I mentioned, and get those tidied in as the cart paths are falling shortly behind. So truly just about 10 more days of work that we need to squeeze in and then we can button things up and get it back open to the public. Is that 10 more dry days or if we have rain and you know, on day six, does that start to clock again? I think, you know, with, with the peak dryness, you know, I, I imagine they're going to watch the forecast as they're working. They get to the lowest areas that are most impacted by water and back their way out um, so that they can take advantage of drier weathers. You know, a single rain event is not gonna saturate the entire course unless we're talking about two inches of rain, which could happen and has happened this year. So um, it's truly just uh, depends on the weather, unfortunately. Um, one more update, uh, Monday, 
Uh, I was before town council requesting an additional appropriation for the five-year master plan uh, so that we can begin that process and get that document before you and town council for adoption at the end of the year. Uh, that discussion was continued until Monday. So I'm hoping uh, at that point, we'll be able to make an uh, approval of that expenditure and begin that process with REA. So I just wanted to provide a short update on that. And that is all from the superintendent report. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from the director of maintenance services, Greg. Good evening, everyone. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of our accomplishments for the month. Um, as you see up on the picture there, that is a uh, our new nursery out here at Trail Park, which is a partnership with um, Zionsville Cub Scout Pack 358. And that project was led by our new natural resource tech, Mallory, and assisted by our, our park and rec team. So they accomplished that in one evening. So that'll we'll be able to utilize that in the future for future plantings. I think in about two years, we'll be able to start selectively pulling some of those trees out of there and uh, transplanting them into our parks. And then eventually let some of them mature, get bigger, and put them in more of our high, high, higher uh, use areas and stuff as they mature. And those are all sycamore trees and uh, red oaks at this time. But as we, as they grow and we transplant, pull some out, we'll be able to sub in other species eventually and we also are partnering partnering with the cub scout group to <laughs> this is my train of thought partnering with to help maintain the nursery as it goes along so they're not just planting them and walking away they're going to help with uh maintaining the nursery with weeding and, and uh, pruning and watering and such as we go through the year so outside of that our other big products we're getting our uh the um, community garden is ready for planting this season. So the team has been out laying them out and getting them staked out and making sure they're all clean and set and ready for the, uh, for all the groups to come out and that have rented plots this year and start gardening. So, how, how are we doing on plot rentals? Are we close to hundred percent? I think we are. I think maybe we are one, but Good. It's filled up. So yeah, we're hundred okay. percent. So great. And some of them have already been out there working on it. So I can see that they're starting to get ready to plant. So other than that, that's about all I have. Anybody has any questions about the report for this month? Well, we are uh, implementing the electronic uh, maintenance accountability system. How, how's that going so far? It's going good. So we're in the build out phase for that right now. So I've been importing data to the company and their techs have helped me build out the different procedures and stuff. So when we build work orders, we can pull from them and plug and play and just start actually building out some of the per preventive maintenance work orders. And I think we're hoping to, uh, we've done some training with the staff on it this week, online training with the with the work order system and getting them signed up and, and registered into it. So we're gonna start gently rolling it out next week with some of the preventive maintenance work orders and then some of the reactive ones as they come. And hopefully by, by the next board meeting, I think we'll hopefully have it fully implemented, but there'll still be building out of other long-term work orders as we go, the kind of the ones that are seasonal, we'll build those out as we go. And so it'll be, it'll take some while to get all the bugs worked out of it, but I, I think in a month, we should be switched over fully using that. So I think it's gonna be good. Great, all right. Anybody have any questions for Greg? A quick one on Starkey Park. How has it uh, fared with the floods of three or four weeks ago? I saw you had to take out some danger trees, but are the, are yeah. the trails holding up? For the most part, we do one? have an issue on trail four with a, it's a recurring recurring issue that we've been looking at. We have to figure out a long-term solution where us culverts plugging up and kind of roading onto the trail system. So, I mean, we have been cleaning it out and we've kind of, that's kind of gotten behind a little bit because of the rains just keeps filling up so quick. So um, that's one thing needs to be repaired. The other trails are for the most part bearing very well. So, but just been doing a lot of cleanup with that, even on our paved trails and sediment and stuff coming up and trying to keep them safe. But, okay, ready to open the staircase. Yeah, we're getting there. So I was out the other day and the grass is establishing pretty good, starting to grow out with the warmer weather. So I think we'll be ready to go. All right, thank you, Greg. Yeah, all right. All right, next we have our Director of Recreation Services, Mindy Murdoch. Good 
Good evening, everyone. So uh, March brought us 21 programs that we did through the Na uh, Nature Center and Recreation. Uh, just a few highlights that happened in the month. Um, we opened our camp registration on March 14th at noon, um, still using the OpenGov system. As of today, we only have, we still have one spot open. Um, so if anyone knows of anybody with a uh, four to five year old, we have one spot in our July Backyard Explorers camp. Other than that, all the other camp spots are filled. So to give you an idea, this year we have 16 camps from ages two all the way up to 12. Uh, so there'll be 300 and, well, we get the one, 321 <laughs> campers. So we did have a few camps that um, we ended up having 21 kids instead of 20, just because I hate separating out siblings. So, you know, if one spot was open and a family with two, we allow that one additional child in. So... Um, in addition to that, the uh, story walk at Elm Street Green did reopen this month. Um, so there is a book there that will run through March and April, and then those will change out with the library monthly all the way through the end of October. Um, so if you haven't gone out and explored that one, uh, we also are just revving up for the start of all of our large events. Um, so as Sarah had said, next week we have Creek Fest here at Town Hall uh, on Saturday the 23rd from nine to noon. We've got a full lineup of presentations actually here in Town Hall, as well as exhibitors out, will be out in the parking lot. Um, but in addition to that, we also um, are currently accepting artist illustrations for our future Zionsville Butterfly Trail which would be a series of eight winks throughout the, the town. Um, so we've gotten quite a number of submissions. So I'm happy to say we'll have to sit and pick and choose um, versus just, hey, we got eight, here's eight. <laughs> um, so we've had quite a number of submissions and that goes to the end of this week for them to turn those in. Um, and then just putting you know, final details on things like um, Life of Lincoln and Barnes and Bruce. If anyone has any questions. I just want to make sure I heard. Did you say that the, the summer camps are full already? Summer camps are full except for one spot. Wow. That's so, great. Yeah. It's going to be a good summer. It's Anybody have any great questions summer. for Mindy? <laughs> yeah. no? Comments? No? All right, Mindy. Thank you. Thanks. But and you probably noticed that uh, Amy is not in her usual spot tonight. She's about 30,000 feet over the Atlantic Ocean right now, I think. And her partner, Tom Witsit is taking her spot tonight. So he's gonna give us the parks attorney report. Tom? Yes, I will. Amy was kind enough um, while she was away to give me uh, an outline of what her report would be. The first item is uh, Everstream, which she's contacted. And that's the company that's seeking an easement under the rail trail north of Mulberry to install a fiber optic cable. And uh, they've been requested to provide a status report and a legal description for the proposed easement area. And once that's completed, uh, then they will provide us with final documents for consideration. And I'm sure that Amy will cover that with you next month. The second uh, point is that she says she's worked with Jared on some items related to the drainage progress, uh, pro project um, on property that's partially owned by the Zionsville United Methodist Church. Uh, there, they will, uh, or the town will need to have a construction and permanent easement from the church. And um, apparently Jared has had a productive and positive meeting with them, but that still needs further work and updates as they provide it. Then um, she reports that she and Jared have worked through some suggested revisions to several contracts. One of those is the agreement with Cardno who will be conducting the Eagle Creek Engineering Design Services in connection with the LARE grant. And that agreement apparently has been executed. And then she says that Jared and she have finalized some items related to the Mulberry Field use agreements and made some minor modifications to the insurance language in the agreement to better reflect current insurance industry practice and typical coverage for sports organizations. Uh, and that was reviewed with the town's insurance agent. Then she's reviewed and made some modifications to the Winterfest sponsorship agreement, which is now in final form and will be used for all sponsors for next season's Winterfest sponsors. 
also related to Winterfest. She said that she and Mindy have discussed and modified the Winterfest food truck vendor agreement, which is now also in final form and ready to be used for next season's Winterfest food truck vendors. Then she says that she's reviewed the agreements for the My Rec program that Mindy presented at last month's meeting. Um, and apparently they're the authorized credit card processor. And she's made several suggested revisions to that agreement and is running into some challenges from them uh, because they don't want to make modifications to their agreement. Uh, and these are some things that she will discuss with the town's insurance carrier and will provide additional information and an update when she works through that with the agent. Then the last thing that really wasn't on her report, but I know it's an issue uh, because I've reviewed various uh, email correspondence between Amy and John and some others is this um, real estate that was acquired from Richard Fosnight and he's supposed to be vacating like by tomorrow. And I don't know if you have any current information with regard to that, but apparently if he's, I mean, and I have reviewed the real estate acquisition agreement and the terms with regard to his departure, which were included in the warranty deed. And he was initially supposed to be out, I think by February 28th. And he was granted an extension, I think, to the end of March. And, he's, and I don't know whether he's out yet or not. And I don't know if you know. I know there has been progress on one of the properties um, with uh, another week or so, and they should be out of there with all their possessions. The other property, uh, we're still having some challenges about the exact timeline uh, for when they will be moving out. Okay, well, the, the other one was, what was their name, Bouye or? Yep. Yeah, our, so they're taken care of pretty much. That's the one that, yeah, they will be out in the next week or so. Okay. So I guess it's a question of um, what the status is with Foss Night and whether or not some legal action may be required to get them out. And I believe Amy was able to get them on the phone um, from overseas and uh, make contact. And they were a little discouraged with the timeline, whether that would be feasible to get out of the house and relocate. So there will likely be additional conversations to, to get that wrapped up. We are approaching our hard deadline of beginning to start the trailhead project. So uh, we did offer you know, an extension which has passed. Um, so we'll have those harder conversations if necessary. I, I anticipate bringing that up with her uh, later this week when I see her. Uh, we, need to, we need to move forward on that. We can't let this linger too much longer. We have a deadline that we have to meet and a construction project that needs to begin and you know, we need to get moving on that. I, I think we've been patient. I think we've been. We still know. have a special meeting scheduled for next Thursday night for consideration of possible bids. Yes, for the northern expansion and some other includes. projects. Yeah, the trail. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. that in the plan. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Anybody have any questions, for Tom? Thank no? you. All right. Thank you. All right. Now on to new business. And uh, for that, we'll turn to Jared. All right. Uh, the first up is the Party in the Park special event application. And I will turn this over to our Director of Recreation Services to explain what this year's party is going to look like. All right, so as you can tell, we're trying to add some new programs and events into the park system. And one of the things we wanted to do is actually have for the last day of school, have a party at Mulberry Fields. Um, so we are going to be having activities there. Um, the parks, hopefully the parks outreach vehicle will be up and running at that time. We already have the library and the bookmobile will be on site. Um, we have some live music. Uh, from uh, one of a high school band actually presenting for us. But one additional thing that we wanted to add to that was the option for food trucks. Um, so that families could really, they could go right after school and spend most of the afternoon there that they weren't having to rush home to try to grab a snack or even grab dinner. Um, so I did reach out and Fundays and Chick-fil-A are both interested. They both were at Winterfest and did very well. Uh, we do have the, the food truck vendor we would just need to get approval from the park board to allow them there because they would be selling on site. So. so 
Would you like a resolution on that and a vote on that tonight? Yes, would okay. like so that we can um, go ahead and contact them and then also get that information to the health department. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? Sounds great. This is a, will be an applications from the parks department to the town under their special event application process. Right, and this right. would be a one-time special event. Um, like I said, we have the food truck vendor, so they will have that application that they filled out similar to Winterfest. They will provide us with insurance as well, as well as the copy for their permit. So, this is what um, we but they would be selling of a private party yes. submitting such a special mm -hmm. event application here. It happens to be sort of ourselves. Right. So I move that we well, approve. hold on, hold on a second. Oh, uh, sorry. Do, do we, is this revenue neutral or is this something that, that will generate some revenue for us? This would be, no, they, we were not asking any money from them. So. Okay. It's just we're asking their time so that families would come and stay longer. Okay. So we're getting, an, we're getting the marketing off of them being there, providing a service to us. Do we have expenses involved in this? No. So if there's electricity use or anything, that's that's not... The, all the, um, they would be self-sufficient. So, okay. yeah. They'll have generators or whatever. And, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Is it limited to just those two vendors? Yes, they're the only two we asked for. Yeah, because we will be closing down the circle. And so with the, the, the bookmobile, the Creek Stomper, which is the new outreach vehicle, and then the food trucks, that circle will be pretty much booked. It'll be full. All right. Anybody have, uh, would like to make a motion that we approve? I move that we permit uh, the Parks Department via Mindy or Jared to uh, engage uh, uh, Gianni food trucks that they deem uh, uh, feasible and, uh, and appropriate for the event called Party in the Park. All right, we have a resolution from King Cassidy. Do we have a second? Second. John Wollenberg seconds. Let's take a vote. Joe Pack. Aye. John Wollenberg. Aye. John Salowitz. Aye. Sarah Moore. Aye. Chris Barksdale. Aye. Tim Cassidy. I say I as well, making it a unanimous vote. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you. All right, now Winterfest 2022. Jared? So we had such a great time at Winterfest last year, we wanna do it again. With over 5,000 skaters on the ice, we are looking into the uh, feedback we received from the community and building the event out even further this year. So. In 2022, we are looking to enter into another contract with Ice America for not only the ice rink rental, but also the operations management of the event. So we are looking at a date of December 9th through January 2nd. And this year, the rink will be bigger as uh, requested by popular uh, polling. Uh, so it'll be approximately 98 feet by 50 feet. So um, with the new layout, we are planning on putting the ice rink on top of the pickleball courts. Uh, during the month of December and utilizing that flat surface um, to build out the event. What we learned last year is uh, Mulberry Fields is pretty low and likes to gather mud. So our primary objective is to build the event out of the mud. So the ice rink will be on this new uh, graded surface that'll provide a flat uh, level space for that. And then we will reutilize the platforms from last year to uh, host seating as well as a lace up area on those platforms rather than in the mud or on the pavement that damages the ice skates. So truly learning from uh, our first year's successes. And um, we'll also locate the ticket booth closer to the ice rink. And that will allow not only for you know, ease of access, but also we can reduce our costs on the Ice America staffing because they'll have that closer proximity to the rink and the ticket booth. So an opportunity for additional cost savings within the quote for 2022 operations. So this year uh, for those uh, ice rink rental and the operation services, the grand total for the 2022 Winterfest Ice America contract is $237,818. Um, and that is approximately 30,000 more than last year, but that is due to um, trucking costs that went up as well as the larger ice rink. So we are looking to continue our campaign for sponsorships throughout the year. Happy to report we have already secured 11,000 at this point. So we are doing much uh, better, much earlier in the year on that aspect. And we look forward to building out this event. So I'm happy to answer any questions. We have the same sponsors as last year? 
So far, yes, uh, three returning sponsors. Um, that is Century 21 Sheets as our title sponsor, um, the Boone County CVB as our uh, rank sponsor, and the Parks Foundation as a community sponsor for that as well. So um, our recreation coordinator, Wendy, is fantastic at uh, meeting and greeting, and she loves to expand the mission and is not afraid to ask for money doing it, so. Are we going to ask our sponsors to uh, be more generous in their donations this year, or are we sticking with the same fee schedule? Um, the title sponsorship was increased 2000 to better capture a little bit of those costs that we experienced. Um, the ring sponsor also went up 500, but truly we wanted to have a, a level where organizations of any size could, could sponsor. So 1000 for the community sponsor level, um, 25 or 3000 for the rink and then uh, 7,000 per title. So the, our expenses are going to be a little bit more uh, this year. What, what leads us to believe that we're going to capture that increase and, and perhaps do better? What do we have? 47% recovery last year. Um, uh, 53 when it was all set. 53. Yeah. Okay. Are, are we going to, uh, is a reason to believe that we're going to recover more of our expenses this year? And, and why, why is that? Um, so truly as an outdoor event, there are factors that we are unable to control. And I would say a large portion of some of our uh, loss in revenue was ultimately the weather last year. So on opening day, um, we had over 300 people visit the reindeer, but then staying, sticking around in 20 degree weather with rain, you know, freezing rain is not ideal for skating. So that's a rough ribbon cutting for the opening day that we had to delay a day as well. So um, with a larger rink, we do know that at our peak hours on the weekends, we were having a wait and having to turn some people away. So that'll alleviate that issue. So during our peak, we'll still be able to have an enjoyable ice experience. We're increasing our hours during the weeks leading up to um, school letting out so that other communities with younger children or even our own homeschooled community and uh, those residents that just wanna go during the daytime that don't have the restrictions of maybe work or school can enjoy the ice rink prior. Um, in addition, we're looking at new advertising techniques so we will be exploring uh, radio advertisements as well as the foundation we built last year, reaching over 19,000 people with our advertising. So we're truly hoping this is a snowball that'll continue to roll and gain more and more attention in the surrounding area. Jared, I've got some questions on some line items. Absolutely. Can I, uh, just bear with me here as I work our way through. Um, on skate aids. Um, those are those blue state things. So two questions. One, this is a state related question. I did hear a lot of people say that they thought that they were priced high. Yes. So seeing the rental rate, I now know why they're priced that way. So my question is, can we either A, eliminate some? Because I don't know that I saw because uh, they're four times an hour, I average saw 20 on the ice at once. Um, there's a little bit of our cars and or offer sponsors so that somebody could take the Kroger skate aid or the Acre True Value skate aid and see if we can offset the cost of maybe limiting that number. That or could we buy them for 4,000 bucks and free use them? So that is what we are beginning to do. Those are great suggestions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, I want to write that down real quick. <laughs> um, so with a larger rink, you know, there is the capacity of having more out on the ice. But we also did hear in the survey data that sometimes there was too many on the ice for our smaller rink. So I think that's appropriate to explore, maybe reduce that number a little bit. Absolutely. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. um, okay, so my next one. So having a little bit of trouble understanding the rink installation and then the production fee and then the shipping that rink it looks like we're talking a lot about this maybe the same thing am i tell me tell me how to break that up because i'm looking at installation supervisors which we're providing the labor it says so what are we paying for it out for Network. So last year, uh, Ice America, a team that didn't actually run the operations, came on site and assisted with installation throughout. So 
while our crews did assist during the regular workday, those those members were working throughout the night sometimes, driving to other areas and repairing the rink that was delivered uh, should it need any attention. So that is a professional skill that we just don't have uh, yet in our operations. So uh, that is a contracted uh, service within the quote. Okay. So this, so where it says two and two, is that like two individuals yes. at $3,500 yep. for two days? If, it, if it's the quantity, I'd have to look at the, yeah. the scope again. It's this number and then term. So, or yep. is it two weeks? How, how long did the install take? I don't know. I think the install was um, right around nine days. Okay. So, I would uh, have to look back at our hotel accommodations because we also provide those. Um, but there were multiple Ice America employees coming from around the country to assist with that install and offload. Okay. Um, and then our, our crews most certainly helped as well with the labor. Okay, so that answers the installation supervisors. And then travel legal admin production for like that production fee, 15,000. Uh, it's like a lot of just years, 15,000. Let's call it a production fee. Yeah, so that actually includes the uh, creation of signage for the event specific Dice America at Zionsville as well as the uh, utilization of their point of sale service uh, for the ice rink rentals. And then uh, the staffing and scheduling of all that. And again, uh, that's a contracted service uh, as a package that we choose for operations. So, you know, it is my ambitions to eventually remove that from these quotes and our team will, will have seasonal hires that we train in house. Yeah. Uh, based on standards of operating ice rinks and uh, minimize that impact uh, for contracted services. Do you think there would be a hotel, say, in town that might like a sponsorship of the event in exchange for giving you the rooms and saving that $4,500? Absolutely. Not only are we uh, going to have that conversation with nearby hotels, but um, also our title sponsor, Century 21 Sheets, has a couple of uh, rentals in the area that they're, oh, they they want to explore that. Because there's yeah. more housing costs down for operations as well. Yeah, and those are contingent on if they're not able to hire local, which last year they were able to. Okay. Yeah, so let me ask, so, so jumping down then to setup here, are we paying that again for like installation? Is that, then it's also built in setup fee? I think the installation of the rink and then the setup of operations are two separate things. Um, so as I mentioned, when they do the regional hiring, it avoids that cost with the hotels, but all those staff are trained, um, you know, day one employees. Okay, so staff hiring training. Okay, the general manager fee. So this payroll, it says gross payroll plus 50%. Yeah, that is the, uh, the cost of last year's operation as well. It was 1.5 of the actual wage so we're paying the payroll and we're paying them 50 percent to pay that payroll yes yeah. what would you do really there? again when we uh, have the capacity to have seasonal hires and train i would love for zionsville parks to be the face that greets our winterfest employees and then also on the ice what is the what is the expertise that they bring because i mean I guess there's the maintenance of the rink, but I'm trying to understand the check-in procedure didn't look so detailed that you could kind of take that for this price and yeah. kind of take that in-house. You know, that's completely fair. Uh, with the new Myrex software, we could explore building Winterfest into that and then staffing the ticket booth on our own and saving the maintenance side for their operations solely. Yeah. Okay. Um, we wouldn't be ready to do that this year, though, huh? There would be a couple moving parts that I can uh, look at and have conversations okay. with. We had a, a great um, hiring last year for just, you know, uh, program support throughout the Winterfest event. We were able to hire some of our seasonal um, camp naturalists, as well as some of our gar golf course employees looking to uh, work during the month of December. So that worked out perfectly with some of our seasonal hires. And I think we could most certainly train them uh, for ticket sales and operations on that side yeah because that's you know not to maintain the zamboni and whatnot right ice, but more just the check-in process was how many what size skate type of thing so if you can be familiar with that software i wonder if that's something we could um, attack and then we 
internet. I'm not sure if that is why it's so obvious, but 9,500, that's assuming 10,000 skaters. Is that just, they put that in there and then we keep track? That was just a blanket coverage policy based on 10,000 skaters. Okay. Yep. So it's not retroactive for if we have 5,000? No, yep. it, it's to cover the event and the liability associated okay. with that, the policy they take out. Is there another, uh, is there a threshold that may be lower than that? Since we were at half of that last year and with the bigger rank and second year, I think I'd feel more comfortable leaving it there. But I really do like your uh, other suggestions. I think those are valuable to explore to lower this cost. Big picture, what do you expect the total out-of-pocket expenses to be for Winterfest and what's, uh, what's the prospect for covering all of those expenses and if we can't cover those expenses uh, is have we should we budget for that or how would we pay for that yep so um sorry can we go back to the first question yeah what's the what all other out-of-pocket expenses on top of ice america's 237 yeah well, so uh what from else is there from first year's operations we learned you know there's the rental of the forklift for loading in, loading out, as well as the storage crate uh, for the ticket booth throughout the month. So um, I'm pretty sure looking at last year, it would be about another 30,000 to this. So we're looking at just under 270. Last year's operation was closer to 290. So we were able to cut some costs. And again, um, there was additional cost savings last year from our original quote of 207. And this year we anticipate a little bit more with the smaller footprint from the ticket booth to the skating rink. And if we're able to implement some of John's suggestions for the staffing. Um, as far as uh, funding that, we do have 150,000 allocated from the fund 211. So 104,000 from Winterfest went into that last year, as well as our shelter reservations and programs throughout the year, creating that sustainable fund. So 150 of that uh, is budgeted for Winterfest and then the remainder will come out of our um, general fund allocation. So, I mean, we can borrow from that fund. What's, what's the expected range of revenues for Winterfest? Uh, the expected range with added hours, you know, it truly weather dependent, but our last year averages were low end 128 up to just under 300,000. So with additional hours and hopefully better weather, uh, you know, we could see closer to that 160 as our minimum and going up from there. So we base that around 50% use throughout the month, knowing that there's peaks and valleys. Um, we're also looking at shortening the hours during the week from 9.30 to nine, because uh, at the end of the night, there's just one or two skaters max throughout the week. So um, trying to tighten up our schedule to lower some of those staffing costs as well. But this is an event that does take a village, so we are aggressively pursuing uh, sponsorships to continue to offset costs. I mean, the event's great, and there's a spirit, and you know that, that can't be quantified in terms of dollars. But I, I still don't see. I mean, do we need to be budgeting for this uh, in our 101 fund? Yes. So uh, I think as we, you know, we see how year two does, and then we actually set up a line item for Winterfest in the general fund to subsidize a part of the event. But based on our allocations of this year, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable we can cover the 85% from this year. And then uh, the last 15% is paid January of next year, um, which will have uh, the ability to pay that out of 2023. And I would say, too, that we also have to think about this as a, a long term investment too. you know, and not get too caught up in what our prospects are for this year. But think of the long term. But ultimately, you know, if this is a good size for Zionsville, this ice rink, we can look at, you know, investing and in purchasing the rink. So then our only rental would be the, the chiller. You know, as long as we have ad adequate space to store the ice rink each season, we maybe rent the chiller and then uh, a manager from Ice America to oversee those operations until we're confident and comfortable of those uh, chilling and ice rink operations as well. So yeah. it, it, it definitely is an investment that we hope to continue to uh, turn profit towards. Okay, you need a resolution from us to accept this bid from Ice America? Yeah, uh, 
with your approval to work with Amy Nooning and her counsel to refine the agreement and get it executed. Would anyone like to make that resolution? Is the, Jared, is the operations, um, have you selected those already or is that based on, I don't know, so it's, it, it's not local, is that, are those kind of to be determined numbers? So, so part of all those administrative costs within that lower operations quote is the recruitment as well. So we didn't recruit Ice America or do interview or employees last year. Uh, that was all housed by the Ice America team. They recruited, uh, interviewed, and then ultimately trained. The general manager fee was that, did you do a lot uh, once they were taking care of any issues or was that? They were uh, completely in operation of the ice rink and the uh, point of sales system. So it, it was really hands off for our staff. We focused on the uh, the 45 programs that we offered throughout the month and uh, also offered additional customer services throughout the event. You know, I think we also need to point out that we did gather a fair amount of uh, information through registrations and things like that, you know, which is which has a value too. you know, hard to quantify that value. but. You know, we were able to call information from people that came out. So, and, and ultimately, you know, we're creating these memories in Zionsville. We're not outsourcing family gatherings and, and special events and memories. We're able to host those in town through the support of the community and as well as the attendees of the event. So uh, there is a certain quantification, I would say, to establishing that, that, uh, that reputation and those memories for Zionsville. That is ultimately our mission. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and make that resolution then that we um, uh, continue down this road with Ice America, subject to legal review, and uh, we have to get approval from the town council too. Uh, this is already appropriated, so okay. All right, so then I'm, I'll make the resolution that we continue down this road with Ice America, subject to legal review, and uh, continue with our planning for Winterfest 2022. Do I, does anybody have a second? I'll second. Jill Pack seconds. Let's take a vote. Jill Pack. Aye. John Wollenberg. Nay. Tim Cassidy. Aye. John Selowitz. Aye. Sarah Moore. Aye. Chris Barksdale. Aye. And I say aye as well. So the vote is six to one in favor. All right, Jared, uh, the big four rail trail art project. All right, uh, to coincide with the expansions of the north and south, as well as the widening, uh, Zionsville is fortunate to be the recipient of a Boone County Community Foundation grant um, for art installations along our rail trail. So, you know, part of our mission this year was to uh, incorporate cultural events and uh, art into our park system to invite a new user out. So uh, upon hearing this, the uh, foundation who has previously sponsored murals in other towns in the community jumped on that opportunity and uh, offered to cover the cost and the project management associated with a mural project along our rail trail. So ultimately we are providing the canvas and the foundation and their selected uh, consultant are going to handle the rest. So very, very fortunate in that they are also sponsoring um, an art installation in Thorntown. So kind of the beginning and the end of the Boone County segment of the Big Four Rail Trail will host art installations that are specific to those communities. So uh, within our uh, system, there are three proposed concepts for art installations. So this is the beginning of the Oak Street Tunnel. I apologize if the scan is not great. I do have the physical rent, uh, drawings which show a little bit more detail if you'd like to see that afterwards so as dahlia city uh the the group wanted to highlight that that history and uh that unique aspect of, of zionsville so each tunnel will also have a plaque that describes the inspiration behind the mural um, and who it was sponsored by in what year so each mural will also have a anti-graffiti coating on the outside so ultimately these blank canvases that have uh been the home to a couple of graffiti will now be covered and then if they are to be vandalized that would easily be removed so moving on uh north on the rail trail as you exit oak street and continue north as you pass under the Bloor street uh bridge we are going to highlight the pollinators 
um, and their role in, in our environment. So the original concept is for uh, honeybees. So in speaking with the consultants, we are going to change that to native pollinators. And uh, within the plaque, we'll explore their importance in the community. Um, continuing north, and this is my personal favorite, entering the, the Mulberry Fields Tunnel, you will enter inside of a log, which will host living organisms as you walk down our longest tunnel. So within the tunnel, there are renderings and drawings of animals as well as fungus and uh, algaes to really highlight you know, that unique habitat that does absolutely serve a role in our community and in our parklands. So again, just uh, embracing an opportunity to invite a new user to our trail system that might not otherwise jump on a recreation trail for their fitness. Just to clarify, these are depictions of living, living organisms. <laughs> that is Correct? a great point, I'm yes. I'm probably gonna have some fun there. <laughs> well, fungus is a living organism, so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, so these pro uh, three projects upon your approval will uh, begin as early as May. The artists will close half of the tunnels after our maintenance team pressure washes them and will begin working on those in tandem with the expansion going on in the north. We were hoping to sync the two projects, but this uh, grant is only good for 2022, so we needed to jump on the opportunity. So residents will still be able to pass and actually, you know, ask a couple questions and uh, see the progress of these murals as they go up over the summer. Who's doing the artwork? The artwork is going to be completed by Chris Blyce and John Edwards. They have uh, performed several murals throughout uh, the Indianapolis Metro, including the one at the Fort Benjamin uh, kind of uh, community there. Um, this is kind of their swan song. So they are going to step away from mural art that they've been doing for the past decades and uh, retreat to a uh, homestead out in the country. And um, he did inform me that after learning about the honeybees versus native pollinators, he will not be having honeybees, but uh, encourage the native pollinators in his backyard. Well, that kind of brings up the thought that I had when I first saw this is that it leads from dahlias to the native pollinators, but dahlias aren't native and they don't necessarily always help the pollinators. Have you thought about a way to make that make more sense. I don't know. <laughs> like True. mix some natives in there with the dahlias. I know we're the dahlia city, but yeah, that's some of good. these, they, the ones with all the petals, they can't really get to at all. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. So we um, originally in this concept, uh, my terrible ideas, you know, I was thinking of kind of what I'd heard about the history of Zionsville, um, Abe Lincoln, the railroad and highlighting those, but truly, you know, almost every community embraces that. We actually have a rail car um, in Independence uh, that just went up as a mural. So to, to find something unique to Zionsville, there is a, a deep history of the, the dahlias in our town. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to explore, making sure it is known that there are native plants and flowers within that community as well. Yeah. And maybe if they just mix a few in and there's yeah. like a, you said there's gonna be education about pollinators, maybe if there was something like that. Absolutely. One thing that was important to me as we embarked on this was that it not be controversial, like the traffic signal box down on Main Street, you know, kind of yeah. controversial. So I'm glad you found the controversy there with the non-native non dahlias. There, so I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> there are more than dahlias in there if you look at it closely. There's, I think there's, there's different kinds there's of dahlias. There's daisies so. and there's, there's other things in there. So Because some of these that are daisies could actually just be a different kind of dahlia because there's a variety of dahlias. True. That one looks like a cone flower, but I'm not. Yeah, it looks like a cone flower. Yeah. We will be sure to sneak those in and uh, make sure they're referenced in the plaque. There we go. What are the names of the muralists again? Chris? This Blyce? is um, Chris Blyce and John Edwards of Blyce and Edwards. Blyce, B-L-Y-C-E. B-L-I-C-E, I believe. So again, this is a uh, completely free opportunity to the town of Zionsville. This is completely funded through the Community Foundation and uh, just requires our coordination for setting up barricades and uh, preparing the services for the artists to arrive. We like the sound of that. And you know, you talked about the railroad theme. Lebanon's kind of embraced the railroad, railroad theme. So this will be something unique to Zionsville and it's colorful and it's nice. And I think, I don't know, I, I, think I really like the way it's turned out. Yeah. I think it looks great. 
Yeah, they are they are beautiful. All right. Does anybody want to make a resolution? I'll make a motion to approve the um, artwork on the rail trail. We have a second. I second. Is that Sarah? Oh, it's Chris. Great. Okay, Chris Barksdale seconds. Let's take a quick vote. Bill Pack. Aye. John Wallenberg. Aye. Tim Cassidy. Aye. John Salowitz. Aye. Sarah Moore. Aye. Chris Barksdale. Aye. I say aye as well. So we have unanimous agreement on that. All right. Excellent. The next uh, thing, Jared, more memorial donation. Um, I have one more thing to slide in there as yep. well. Um, so uh, as a part of that very large grant from the Community Foundation, they are also going to be placing half mile and mile markers throughout the parks or throughout the trail, the Big Four Trail throughout the county of Boone County. So 28 miles of mile markers. Um, if you look at the display on the screen, they'll look very similar to the signage out at Starkey Park. So these signs will be utilized for safety and co uh, corresponding with um, emergency services when you need to identify where you are on the trail and where services are needed. So uh, Starkey Park was set up with the sheriff and has been utilized by Zionsville for years. And uh, we're going to take that theme and carry that throughout the rail trail. So um, Zionsville will be green for the uh, high school, um, Whitestown blue, Lebanon goldish yellow. And uh, going up through the county, each community will have their unique color, but the uniform B4 trail and then the mile marker. So again, this is a completely sponsored uh, project from the Boone County Community Foundation, and which includes not only the signs, but also the installation. So our only obligation would be to coordinate with them for those placements. Is the trailhead uh, mile zero? I really or tried you know? for that. They are actually putting it at the county line. So uh, the trailhead is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5. <laughs> so if you truly wanna do all 28 miles, you have to go down Zionsville Road and then start. <laughs> uh, but we have been in discussion with Colfax and they will continue our um, mileage count. So from 28 miles in the county, it'll become 28.5 in uh, Clinton County. And so we've already passed this as part of our resolution. Do we need to make a resolution? We can make a separate one for this just to have it in the record. Okay. Anybody? I'll make a motion to approve the mile markers. Okay, Joel makes the motion. Anybody have a second? I'll second. Sarah Moore seconds. Uh, let's do this by acclamation. Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Moving on to our memorial donation program, still highly successful and we feel very proud to offer this to the community to not only memorialize their loved ones, but also provide amenities in our park system. So we are placing our original bench uh, collected over 2021. Uh, these seven applications that were unfortunately delayed because of supply chain uh, issues. We finally have those in and we will be placing those throughout the month. Uh, tonight, we have our first golf course memorial donation. So there is the request for a tree to be placed between uh, holes eight and nine. And working with Mike out at the golf course and Greg, we have found a good location that will allow the tree to prosper while not impacting gameplay at all. So we'll pick an appropriate tree for that site and uh, memorialize that individual's loved one. So happy to answer any questions or uh, receive a motion to approve that memorial donation. Does anybody have a motion to approve? I would make a motion to approve the Joan Mullenberg makes the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Jill Pack seconds. I think we can do this by acclamation too. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, let the record show that was unanimous. All right, now moving on to the dog park. Jared. So with a full year of operations under our belt, uh, we are happy to say the dog park is uh, welcoming over 500 residents at this time to appreciate the park and enjoy it with their canine companions. So what we've also noticed is that not everyone is on the same schedule. So in fact, uh, there are many periods throughout the day where the dog park is completely bare of any canids. Um, it just so happens even with nice weather, we're only experiencing about 40 people a day at our peak last summer on the most gorgeous days. So we feel confident that we can open this up to the, the outside of the community 
And those neighbors near Whitestown that are close to this park, but are not truly Zionsville residents, could also have an opportunity to enjoy this investment in our community. So they would uh, register and have to be required to have the same vaccinations and records uh, on file and would pay a non-resident fee of $120 for the year, which is um, $50 more than our resident rate. Oh, $75 is the resident rate. Um, so with your approval, I'd like to uh, begin to open up a limited number of application spots for non-Zionsville residents to the dog park. So our first uh, observation window will be 100 uh, places. Um, and at that point, we'll continue to monitor and close that um, offering should we start to see increased activity throughout the day. So I take it there is no waiting list anymore for Zionsville residents or yep. anyone else. Yep, so we are receiving about two to three applications a month. Uh, which are easily processed, and then they get to enjoy the uh, golf course, the the dog park. So a, r a really small amount. There was a, a mad rush at the beginning of registration, and then we saw another upting up upswing as we opened up registration from that initial 300. But now the trend has been just truly, you know, residents that get a new dog or um, want to check out the dog park. So it is extremely limited at this point. Is is that a uh an annual fee? Yes. So um, are we at the point where people will start renewing? Yes. Um, Do we know how that's looking? So uh, that is tricky. So we're only seeing about 60% uh, renew from our first year. And that might be because it's January and they want to save a couple months. I completely understand that. It's um, been too wet to have a dog yeah. park lately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is mud. We can't, we can't beat that. Um, but also, you know, the challenges with OpenGov, we are experiencing, we're not sure that the email notifications are going out, um, even though they say they're sent. I got enough. two. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, there should be three prompts before the actual expiration of your uh, membership. So that's okay. good to hear. Yeah. So whether it's just, you know, it was, a, it was something to explore and then it's not the right time, or truly just waiting a couple months um, to have a friend at the dog park in the summer, not sure. It totally seems we have the capacity there, at least anecdotally, we have the capacity. And you're telling me that the uh, data bears that out, that we have absolutely room at the dog park to bring in. I think I don't see any reason why we should. Uh, the more dogs, the better, right? So they may have a, want to make a motion? I would make the motion that we open up registration for the dog park to those individuals or families outside of Zion. John Wollenberg makes the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. And uh, we'll take a vote by acclamation. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you, Jared. Now on to old business. You're gonna tell us the good news about the bridge being in place over Starkey Road, right? The good news about the bridge over Starkey Road is we have a bridge over Starkey Road. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Last Friday, the bridge was delivered and raised and set. So from here, the contractor will uh, form the mud walls and backfill the bridge as well as pour the deck. So we are anticipating an opening of Starkey Road, Starkey Avenue Road, um, on April 22nd. So uh, coming up on a following Friday. So that is weather dependent today. We probably lost a little ground, but the forecast moving forward looks extremely sunny. So we are hoping to get that road back to open. Uh, we appreciate the community's patience as this project was delayed due to an unforeseen utility relocation, but we are happy to be back on schedule and we will get the road back open and then open up the trail uh, in the middle of next month. Is it opened once we pave it? Is that the key thing That yeah. in terms of opening? Uh, no, no plans to open it as gravel or mud. Right, yeah, but as mud at this point. <laughs> And that should be uh, a fairly quick turnaround. The you know the roadbed up there, Tim was yeah. laid out by the railroad 150 years ago, and it's still good, right? Yeah. So they can yeah, use no, that. Yeah, it looks in great shape. Been, yeah, so it's yeah. it'll should be should roll pretty easily. That's right. Asphalt machinery. Yeah. So. Yep, pavement pavers only move so fast, but they have a very easy course going down to the Vontero subdivision. Yeah. And if you haven't been over there to see it, it's really amazing. It, it changes everything having that bridge there as opposed to the one that was there before. It looks really nice. 
So I think people are going to appreciate it when they can start using it. All right. And is there more on the Southern extension? Um, everything else is on track and we look forward to opening the Southern expansion at the same time as Overly Warman, which we'll discuss next. So uh, Overly Warman Park, an update. The uh, contractor continues to make progress out at the site, putting the finishing touches. Ultimately, the largest uh, task left is the reforestation and the asphalt paving. So Overly Warman, you know, a large portion of that does flood seasonally. So there are some mud challenges but we have extended the uh, time to completion into May and the contractor felt more than confident they can complete the project within that time window. So we are looking at hosting a ribbon cutting for Overly Mormon Park on May 20th at 9 a.m. So we will meet at the new pedestrian bridge from the rail trail down into the park and have a ribbon cutting ceremony then. Has the bridge been, uh, has the surface of the bridge been paved already or is that happening at the same time as the Starkey Park where the Starkey Road it's paved? The, the bridges are concrete, the, the yeah, top yeah, decks, yeah. but the uh, the asphalt paving will be simultaneous. <laughs> yep. No, no, but uh, is the concrete, the concrete's on the surface of yes. the pedestrian bridges, both, well, overly warm and pedestrian bridge and it will be soon on the Starkey Avenue pedestrian bridge. Yeah, I, uh, Trisha was out there today. I. They were supposed to pour Monday, which was favorable weather. So they might have accomplished that. Nope, nope, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but that is still uh, planned. Any other questions related to the Southern Extension or the Overly Warman Park? All right, that is all the updates I have. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, any other board related items that anyone has to bring up? All right, and with that, we'll move on to claims. Has everyone had a chance to look over the claims? And are there any <coughs> questions or comments about those? Nope. All right. Can uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve the claims as uh, presented? I move we approve claims as presented. Tim Cassidy makes a move or <laughs> makes the motion. John Wallenberg seconds it. And we'll take a quick vote. Uh, Jill Pack? Aye. John Wallenberg? Aye. Tim Cassidy? Aye. John Salowitz? Aye. Sarah Moore? Aye. Chris Barksdale? Aye. I say aye as well, making that unanimous. All right, I want to remind everyone to sign the paperwork before you leave, please. We're really almost up to date, we're so close. <laughs> and if uh, we get a little bit of cooperation, we will be up to date after tonight. So that's important. And also uh, a reminder, we have a special meeting set for Thursday, April 21st, seven o'clock. We all looked at our schedules last time and agreed that that was a good time for a meeting. It's important we have a quorum there. So if anybody can't make it, please get in touch with me and let me know. We have to make sure we have uh, enough people here to take a vote on the bids for the project. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you for your attendance tonight. And uh, with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. On Salowitz makes the motion. Second. second. Sarah, yep. you? Sarah Moore makes the second. And we're gonna take an acclamation vote on that. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. All right, that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you on the 21st, right back here. I have to work with after somebody opposed that. <laughs>